So when I was little, I wanted to be an astronaut. I loved space. I memorized the planets and their moons. Do you know the Martian day is 24 hours and 37 minutes? Because I did when I was six. I wanted to be the first person to take a step on the red planet, take that next giant leap for mankind. But as I grew older, that giant leap became quite literal. I grew taller and taller, and when I graduated high school, I was crushed to discover that puberty had screwed me out of my dream job. <laughs> you see, the maximum height of a NASA astronaut is six foot three, and I was six foot five. So to Mrs. Barkley, my first grade teacher, when you told me I could grow up to be whatever I wanted to be, <laughs> you lied. <laughs> so I went to the quintessential backup plan, the profession where everyone goes, where they give up on a life of dreams and adventure. I became a lawyer. <laughs> There's a few in the room, apparently. <laughs> well, when I graduated law school, I had my first big case across the river in Madison County, Illinois, and I was a king. I couldn't lose. I won every motion, every hearing, and we came into trial with a stacked deck. I felt pretty good about my job choice until my second case, which was in Jackson County, Missouri, over in Kansas City. I went from king to pauper. I couldn't win anything. I couldn't win a hearing. I couldn't win what day of the week to start the trial on. The only thing I won in that case was a parking ticket I got while I was stuck in court. <laughs> but this awoke the engineer in me. How was it possible to change the outcome of a case just by changing the location? I mean, these were two similar cases. My facts were similar. My legal arguments were just as good, but the outcomes were completely different based on location or the judge changing, or the parties changing. I wondered if there was truly institutional bias or if I was going crazy. So I began to dig deeper. Yeah. I found I wasn't crazy. In Suffolk County, Massachusetts, it's where Boston is, plaintiffs, people who bring a lawsuit, have a 25% chance of winning on average. Here in St. Louis, it's 57%. Again, average across all cases, all case types. I went deeper and found that 80% of qualified black jurors in certain counties in Alabama are rejected from jury duty despite the fact that the Supreme Court has said rejection based solely on race is unconstitutional. <laughs> Maybe most concerning was this graph. Has anybody ever seen this graph before? Anybody have any idea what it is? It's the probability of being granted parole. So as the day starts, you have a very high probability of being granted parole, and then it drops and drops, it spikes and drops and drops, and spikes and drops and drops again as the day goes on. This is one day. Anybody know what the spikes are? They're food breaks. So the likelihood of you being granted parole is not just dependent on the crime you committed or the behavior you've had since then, but it's fundamentally and directly correlated to the blood sugar level of your judge. What kind of legal system do we have when one of the best things you can bring into a courtroom isn't legal counsel, but a cupcake? <laughs> and I, I wanna be clear here, I'm not throwing stones, right? I, uh, I'm a lawyer, I, I don't think I'm above the biases that the rest of the industry has, has been faced with. I don't think I'm immune to them. I don't think we all are. We, these are human biases. And I also want to be clear, I'm not saying that the law is broken. I'm saying that the humans who write the laws, who interpret the laws, who enforce the laws, those humans have a fundamental bias that has a substantial effect on the outcome of a lawsuit. It can change guilt to innocence. It can change a multi-million dollar verdict to a defense verdict and it can change parole to another stint in prison. So when I was faced with all these things, I, I didn't think I was above them, but I felt I had a duty to make them right. So a few years ago, I quit my job, and I started a company that predicts the future behavior of patent attorneys and patent examiners. We examine the biases, predict the outcomes, and sell the data to the other side in hopes that transparency will be the best medicine. Because I believe my hero, Justice Brandeis, was correct when he said, sunlight is the best disinfectant. So the first thing we had to do was get a hold of the data. Luckily for us, open government is enshrined in our society as a fundamental principle. It's enshrined in the Sixth Amendment that allows us to have public trials. Any one of us can walk into a courtroom tomorrow and see a criminal proceeding and ensure that the government is not infringing upon the rights of the accused. 
These rights were further codified when President Johnson signed the Freedom of Information Act into law in 1966. Today, most patent applications are actually available publicly, except with a few exceptions for those that maybe affect national security. And even better, since 2001, all patent applications are electronically downloadable. If you don't agree with my numbers, you can go home tonight, download every patent application since 2001, and check my figures. It's about 6 million files and about 900 terabytes, so enjoy, but you can do it. After we got the data, the next thing we had to do with, was process the data. So uh, a little patent 101 for those who have forgotten their schoolhouse rock. Uh, a patent is an invention. It's not a brand name like Coke. It's not a logo like the Nike swoosh. It's not a book, a record, or a movie. It's an invention. You file your patent application with the USPTO, the US Patent and Trademark Office. And they assign it to a person who's like a judge. They're called a patent examiner. And the patent examiner will grant your patent application if you meet the legal requirements. And quickly, the legal requirements are noun. That they're non-obvious, useful, and novel. So what does that actually mean? Say one of the geniuses in this room invents a better mousetrap. Is it patentable? Well, uh, if it's just a bigger mousetrap, it's probably pretty obvious. If it's not a better mousetrap, but a better zombie trap, it's probably not that useful because the zombies don't exist, despite what my college roommate continues to say. <laughs> and if it's a better mousetrap, but it copies a design that's already out there that somebody else has invented, it's not novel. All right? So now that you're all ready to take the patent bar, let's talk some numbers. If you filed a patent application today, it would take 18 months before an examiner even looked at it. The Patent Office in the United States today has a 600,000 application backlog that they're currently going through. Furthermore, when the examiner finally did pick up your application, there's a 9 in 10 chance they're going to reject you on the first time. Most lawyers actually now consider a rejection a right of passage because they don't think, if they didn't get a rejection on the first time, they think they didn't claim run enough scope in the first application. Not only that, if you disagree with an examiner, you can file an appeal but that'll take an extra two years on average. Furthermore, the USPTO proudly admits that the patent examiners are upheld by the appeal board 50% of the time. Imagine you went into your boss's office and got a report card and found out you did your job wrong half the time. Imagine you'd keep your job, and yet that's the statistic for a very long time at the patent office. What's even more concerning is that me and my peers have figured out that number's wrong. Patent examiners are only upheld in full about 34% of the time. The other 16%, they're affirmed in part, reversed in part, which is lawyers speak for, eh, kind of close. <laughs> but let's talk about allowance rates overall. What do you think's the probability of getting a patent? If you file today, an average patent, everybody, let's do an experiment, let's do a poll. Everybody stand up for me. I know it's early, you can do it. Yeah, there we go, everybody stand up. Who thinks that there's a zero to 20% chance for an average patent to get granted? Sit down if you think that. All right, we got a few. All right, sit down if you think. All right, 20 to 40% chance. All right, a lot of sitters. 40 to 60%? All right, 60 to 80%. Still got some standing, all right. 80 to 100%. Still a few standing, so we're gonna talk about basic math after this, but that's cool. <laughs> we're here to learn. 70%. So the cohort, 60, 80%. It's 70%. Who is completely stunned? That number seems super high to people. Yeah. So 70% chance of an average patent application being filed and getting granted. But there are some really strong biases we've discovered that can pull you away from the mean. Large companies outperform small companies, but they outperform small companies by about 20%. So large companies, when filing a patent application, have a 20% higher chance than small companies of getting that patent. Me and my peers have done kind of the first of its kind gender study in the patent office. So 25% of patent examiners are female, uh, which is good news for most inventors because men are easier to get a patent passed by about 5%. Women are also two months faster. So when the USPTO says we want to become more exacting and more efficient, I've got a really good strategy, hire more women. There we go. But the single biggest bias, the single biggest effect on your likelihood of getting a patent or not is your individual examiner. There are examiners at the patent office who have granted only 1% of the applications they've ever seen. There are others who have granted 95% of everything they've ever seen. 
There's somebody smart in the audience saying, hey, he's just picking outliers, this is cheating, there's no way you would run into that big a divergence just from one application. Not totally true. You see, if you filed a food application today, there's a pretty good chance you're gonna be in front of a group of examiners, which include Jeff and Scott, these are real guys. They have the same boss, they operate under the same legal framework, and they handle statistically the same applications. Jeff has a 22% allowance rate, Scott has a 73% allowance rate. By just luck of the draw being assigned to one or the other, you change your probability of getting a patent by 50%. How many Googles, how many Microsofts, how many Boeings, how many Emersons, how many companies died at the startup stage waiting for a patent that they just statistically ended up on the wrong side of the bell curve, just from bad luck? How big of an effect does this have on our economy? One final thing uh, that we've been doing research on lately, with the gender analysis, we still have more work to do with gender bias in the patent system. Male in patent examiners, we've been able to show, prefer male inventors. So male applications, applications that include male inventors do better in front of male patent examiners. Female patent examiners, unfortunately, also prefer male inventors. We're not there yet, so we still have more work to do, but it's by a statistically significant margin. So what do we do? I hope we don't follow Shakespeare's advice. But think about it, if we got rid of the lawyers, we'd have to get rid of the judges and the patent examiners and the clerks and the juries and the inventors because they're all biased too. You'd have to get rid of all of us. So do we just hand our legal system over to a computer? I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. We all know how that ends up. So what do we, what do, we do? What do we do about the human problem? This is a real question. I believe the answer is empathy. Empathy. We don't need less humanity at every level of the legal system. We need more of it. We need more empathy and we need more data. We need access to the information to understand our own internal biases. We need patent examiners to realize that they are disfavoring applications by women because the ones I talk to don't even realize they're doing it. We need to protect racially diverse juries, especially when race is an issue in a case. We need to get some judges some damn cupcakes. <laughs> and, and all joking aside, let's be honest, if we realize that blood sugar has a fundamental effect on our behavior, then when we're making key decisions, we should be tracking our blood sugar and understanding that we're not above being affected by things like lack of sleep, poor diet. We need more data and more empathy so that we can someday have a more transparent predictable and equitable patent system, and I truly hope someday more transparent, predictable, and equitable world. Thank you.